you built the original music recommender system, it's used by hundreds of millions of people every day in the world. That's wild. You have this like nice sort of Ge geographical like property proximity means something if there's two yes. points that are close to each other it means like those tracks are very similar so i ended up building this vector database that basically helps you do those queries very fast i think there's a huge opportunity to to still build you know search engines and kind of rethink them from ground up give it 10 20 years i think we're gonna have 10x more engineers mm -hmm. doing 10x more stuff mm -hmm. at you know 10x less the cost mm -hmm. due to better tools Eric, welcome to the Super Data Science Podcast. And Thank you. <laughs> it's awesome to have you here. Uh, and in my apartment, it makes filming so much fun for me. I understand you had a nice, easy walk over here. I did. My office is like two blocks away from here. And uh, I also live like five blocks from here. So it's very convenient for me. Super convenient. Well, we set all of this up for you. I moved into this apartment originally with this in mind years later. Is that why it's so clean in here? To... It's yeah, very... exactly. <laughs> it's... It's really, it's like, it's a prop. It feels like you just moved <laughs> in it. It's so clean. Um, so I know you through Sarah Catanzaro. Yeah, she's great. She is really great. Yeah. Uh, she did episode number 601 of the podcast. So if listeners are looking for an episode on venture capital in general, or particularly if you're interested in venture capital applied to data science companies, incredible episode. She was so generous with her time. It blows my mind that somebody who is a general partner at a major venture capital firm makes that kind of time to create such an amazing interview for the audience. So. Yeah, yeah. I think Sarah plays a long game. She, uh, she has like a fantastic network. I, I talked to her for many, I took money from Sarah. So like I, I, I know her quite well. <laughs> Does she know that? <laughs> uh, no, I haven't told. And then I, no, but uh, so, but but I, I really think that she's uh, she stands out in, in terms of having a huge network and always like willing to connect and intro to people to people. And yeah, we've had you are the third in a trio of incredible guests that I recently had on the program, all recommended by her. So uh, we had Emre Ketchiman in episode six thirteen, Sean Taylor in episode six seventeen, and then now Eric. Uh, the, the final of three for now from Sarah. I'm sure she might have more. I'll try to squeeze her. I'm sure. <laughs> uh, absolutely fantastic guests. Um, so you are currently the CEO of Modal. So it's a new startup. Yep. Um, and so what pressing data issue does your company Modal solve? Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of like to say like purely selfishly, I built Modal to solve a bunch of stuff I always wanted uh, working with data for, I don't know how many years, 15 years maybe. Uh, so, so modal is a way to basically get rid of a lot of traditional infrastructure that I find gets in the way of me actually building things and scaling it out and productionizing things and, and, and um, scheduling things. Uh, so the idea is it's like sort of like a serverless data execution engine in the same vein as kind of maybe like Lambda. Uh, or gotcha. Vercel, maybe what Vercel is doing for front-end team. Actually, fun, I met Guillermo last night, uh, the, the, the CEO of Vercel. Um, in, in, a, in, a, in a similar way, like, I feel like there's an opportunity to build something for data teams where you don't have to think about infrastructure, where you can just like, write code and like, ship it into the cloud and it just like, works. So that's sort of aspirational what I've been working on. That sounds really exciting. I think we're going to get into later in the episode talking about some of your open source projects. So this kind of sounds like a theme throughout your career. You identify major problems, things that you would like to have, tools you'd like to have, and then you invent them. Yeah, and I feel like I do it almost like out of spite sometimes. I'm like, this is annoying. Like, why isn't there a better tool? And I'm like, then I'm like, finally, like, I'm like, I give in. I'm like, I guess I'll have to do this then. And then I build it. So I, I, I think that's been the common theme throughout my career is like, I, I never wanted to build anything of this, but I kind of felt like I had to because there was a gap. Nice, yeah, and it sounds like you're onto a gap here with Modal. Uh, being able to, as you say, just ship uh, data science solutions into the cloud relatively seamlessly, that is a holy grail. Uh, I think so too, Yeah, I think so too. Um, so besides data engineers, it seems like an obvious candidate for your target market. Um, who else is in your target market for this tool? I mean, I, I think in, it's actually very gener general in the sense that we're building something that arguably like aims to replace Kubernetes, which is kind of, you know, a big, you know, audacious goal. Um, yeah. And in that sense, I, I think, um, you know, anyone who uses Kubernetes really, you know, but in particular, we tend to focus right now on the types of problems that data teams have. And, and so it's primarily data 
I don't know, there's like 500 titles today, but you know, data engineers, data scientists, like machine learning engineers, maybe analytics engineers, like maybe, I don't know, whatever new role there is today. But um, it, it's, it's a fairly general product in the sense that I think for the stuff that you need to write in code, which I think there's always going to be stuff you're going to have to do. I mean, there's like amazing stuff you can do with SQL today and like a big fan of, of data warehouses in general. But there's always stuff you're going to have to write code for. And like today, when you write code, it's kind of hard to, to productionize it and scale it up. And like, you know, you have to deal with Docker and Kubernetes and I don't know, all these other stuff, Helm charts and Terraform and like AWS. And like, what if there's like a way where you can just like work with the cloud where you just like feel like it's just, you know, your local computer? Yeah, so Kubernetes is designed to work really well with Docker containers, which you just mentioned. Yeah. Does modal work with Docker containers or kind of it, it allows you to circumnavigate them entirely? You can use Docker containers with modal, um, but we don't use Docker. I mean, Docker containers are sort of just like same thing as like um, OCI containers, which is an underlying file format. And modals essentially uses the same idea of like containers uh, that format of like, here's like a root file system. What is a container? Container is like a root file system. It's like the, you know, the slash, you know, directory on, on Linux and then the whole root file system. And in the same way, we, we basically let you package those things and execute them in the cloud. Containers, there's like the runtime side of it, which is like, you know, there's a bunch of ch root and sec comp and a bunch of stuff. And, and for a lot of stuff, people use virtual machines too. Uh, so that's the other side of it. And, and we, we, we've had to build all of these things. Like we've had to build our own file system. We've had to build our own container runtime. We had to build our own container builder, which actually uses the Docker file syntax. Because um, I think Docker, like, you know, it has, you know, for what it's worth, become a little bit of a standard, you know, for sure. file format or yeah. whatever you want to call it, any change format for containers. Yeah, we talk about it all the time on the show. Uh, and anybody who's come on and talked about ML ops, Docker is one of those tools that they're like, you got to know Docker, you got to know Kubernetes, at least for now. Uh, but it sounds yeah. like maybe in the future, people will be talking about modal instead. Yeah, my, my life goal is no one should have to write YAML or Docker files <laughs> in, in the future. Nice. Um, so um, in addition to your company, you are renowned for your blog posts. So I've known about you personally for many years because of your blog posts. So very frequently they make it to the top of Hacker News. And so when Sarah mentioned that she could introduce me to Eric Byrne, I was like, please, immediately. Uh, and I got you on the show as quickly as I could. So an example of a great blog post of yours is one on um, industrial bottlenecks and why software engineers need better tools. So we'll have a link to that blog post in the show notes. Can you elaborate on this particular blog post for us? Yeah. I'm actually very glad you like brought that blog post up because it's a, one of the blog posts that I feel like I thought the most about, but actually never made it to Hacker News. So I'm glad it's like oh, a little bit of extra really an underground <laughs> pick here on yeah, Super Data yeah, no, Podcast. Yeah, you picked the underdog. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I think the thesis of that one was that I, I feel like, you know, if you look at engineers, and I mean, there's actually multiple theses in that blog post, but like if you look at engineers, like there's this like, I don't call it paradox, but like, Engineers, as engineers get more productive and as engineers get better tools, they actually end up, the demand actually goes up because suddenly there's like this whole new thing, a uh, whole new set of uh, use cases for engineers, right? Like, and, and I mentioned a lot of examples in the blog post, but like, you know, 20 years ago, like it wasn't worth building customized, like, you know, website management system for dentists. But now, like, I think there's a bunch of startups doing that, right? Like, because, like, the cost of building a startup to, you know, serve the dentist market is, like, low enough that you can actually do that. And I think a lot of it comes back to, you know, down to, like, better tools. Engineers have better tools today. The other thing that I think is sort of interesting, the sort of flip side of that is, I look back, like, sort of historically, demand of, for engineers have often been expressed in, like, in terms of demand for no-code tools. So, like... You know, back in, I don't know, like the early 2000s, for instance, like everyone was raging about Dreamweaver or whatever. It's maybe like not the best analogy, but like people were saying, oh, like we maybe not, no one's not, is this the end of HTML? Like, are people even gonna have to write HTML in the, in the future? Like, you know, we're gonna have all this, you know, WYSIWYG tools and like people just build websites and, you know, they're not gonna need engineers for that anymore. As it turns out, like, you know, those tools still exist. I mean, there's like, you know, there's, um, what's it called, Squarespace and, and yeah. Webflow and a bunch of those tools. 
But if you look at the number of front engineers, I bet it's like 100x more in the world right. today than right. it was like, you know, 20 years ago. Right. So clearly, like, there was a huge need for engineers. And so I, I think this, uh, the same thing could be said of many other tools. Like, you know, there's, there's always this, like, tension where, like, there's a lot of demand for engineers, and then people try to invent tools to go around engineers, and then they point to those as saying engineers are no longer going to be needed. But in fact, I think what's, what's going to, what generally tends to happen is, like, then you give better tools to engineers, then they become more productive. The demand for engineers actually goes up. Right. So I don't know. I think, you know, give it 10, 20 years, I think we're going to have 10x more engineers mm -hmm. doing 10x more stuff mm -hmm. at, you know, 10x less the cost mm -hmm. due to better tools. I agree 100%. And so then the connection that I would like to try to draw here is between modal and that blog post with the idea that a tool like modal allows data scientists, for example, to be able to push things to production without necessarily having all of the engineers that you might need today or you might have needed a few years ago to get that into production and be performant. Yeah, yeah, and, and so I think, I think that I'm glad you made that connection because I think it's a really profound one. I think that data teams, I was a CTO for many years, and I, I, so I managed a lot of different teams, and, and I think it's fair to say, and I hope no one takes offense, but like, I think data teams are just not quite where other teams are in terms of productivity. Like the sort of tools they're using and the sort of workflows they're using, if I look at like front-end engineers and back-end engineers, like I see a more of like a mature set of tool chain, right? Like it's less fragmented. People sort of, you know, between companies generally tend to argue and like there, there is an emergence of certain things in the data team. I mean, I think DBT is a good example. Like there's this sort of more of a standardization. Airflow may have been an example 10 years ago. Um, but I, I still think that, you know, like data teams struggle a lot with, with uh, infrastructure. Uh, they struggle a lot with, you know, uh, uh, the tools they're using, you know, whether it's like tens of thousands of SQL queries, each that are hundred lines long and how to like maintain that. And, and another manifestation of the same thing is like a lot of data teams, you know, a lot of companies when they tend to get big enough, they end up building their own internal data platforms, which to me is like more of a less, is a less direct waste or like sort of lack of productivity. But like, if you think about how many thousands of companies each, you know, are building their own data platforms. That is a lot of wasted effort. Like someone right. should just build it for them and sell them, you know, and totally. that generally tends to be what tools do for you. Like instead of, you know, you know, all these companies building sort of, you know, half-baked tools, what if like, you know, centralized infrastructure is just being sold back to them? I think on the other hand though, like you mentioned like, you know, in the future we may not need as many data engineers. I actually think going back to what I said about, you right. know, the, the, the industry and, you know, or, or sort of industrial changes, making data teams more productive may in fact drive up the demand for data right, engineers, right, right. right? Just not on that specific problem. So right. it frees them up from, uh, so the data scientist who now no longer needs to be yoked to the data engineer to get their solution into production, that data scientist can be making data tools that some other data engineers can use. I think is kind of your point. Yeah, and so exactly. It feeds into this ecosystem. And, and who business, you know, maybe the business, you know, teams need it. Maybe, you know, I, I'm sure if you went to like the average CFO at, you know, the average company and said, him, here, you know, told him, here's like 10 data engineers. Like, what can they build for you? Let's automate your entire like financial systems. Like he would be like, or she would be like amazed, right? And I think, so, you know, that's just one example. I'm, I'm sure, you know, if you go around like just looking at, different, you know, aspects of a pr the average web, you know, e-commerce site or web product or whatever. This is so much stuff where you could maybe incorporate more like machine learning, personalization, like relevance, like there's like so many untapped, you know, I mean, this goes for engineers as a whole, but like, I think mm -hmm. especially for data teams and data engineers and data scientists, there is a, you know, and I think there's an incredible latent demand where if you lower the cost, suddenly we can have so much more totally. data being leveraged throughout, you know, products and companies. Today's show is brought to you by Datalore, the collaborative data science platform by JetBrains. Datalore brings together three big pieces of functionality. First, it offers data science with a first-class Jupyter Notebook coding experience in all the key data science languages, Python, SQL, R, and Scala. Second, Datalore provides modern business intelligence with interactive data apps and easy ways to share your BI insights with stakeholders. And third, Datalore facilitates team productivity with live collaboration on notebooks and powerful no-code automations. To boot, with Datalore, you can do all this online, in your private cloud, or even on-prem. Register at datalore.online slash SDS and use the code SUPERDS for a free month of Datalore Pro and the code SUPERDS5 for a 5% discount on the Datalore Enterprise Plan. Yeah, so we have these wins at our back, several of them. One of them is 
more abundant data tools, cheaper data tools. Yep. And then in addition, we have cheaper data storage, way more sensors collecting way more diverse types of data. For sure. Um, and then compute uh, being cheaper as well. Yep. Um, so with all of these tailwinds, I mean, yeah, I agree with you totally that in 10 years, I think we'll have 10 times as many people working on uh, software problems related to data in some way. Yeah, yeah, totally. And, and I think when I think about tools, like I think what's, you know, what part, a big part of why I started Modal wasn't necessarily like, I want to build this like low level, like container runtime. Like I started with the question of looking at data teams, it seems like they could be doing things more productively, like, like they could be more productive, they could be more efficient. And so kind of looking at the different aspects of how they worked, like I ended up, you know, or, or how they operate, like I ended up realizing like I want to start at the lowest level. But I think it's always been with that sort of end goal, how do I make data teams more productive? And I think that's, you know, in general, like how, how to think about tools, right? Like tools is all about like making engineers or other people more productive. Um, this might be a dumb question. Maybe I should have done research into this before <laughs> I asked it. <laughs> okay. Um, so what does the modal name mean? Where, does that, where did that come from? Yeah. That, <laughs> it, it kind of, so the long story, or like the, the, the real story is that originally, you know, I, I, I started building a tool that like sort of looked like multi-processing, if you're familiar with multi-processing. And, uh, and the idea was like, I wanted to build like multi-processing, but instead of like processes, it actually moves the computation to the, co to the cloud, but it preserves the same API. Uh, for various reasons, I started calling it polyester, because mm -hmm. like my thinking is like polyester is kind of a thread. So mm -hmm. it's like fabrics, so it has that analogy, and then poly multi. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, at some point I realized I don't like the term polyester, it just sounds weird. Uh, so I, at some point, just Googled like types of fabric, and modal turns out to be a type of fabric. <laughs> modal, so, so we picked that name Got because it. of that. I, it also sounds good. I, I don't know. Like modal also like means like thirty five other things. Yeah. There's like modal jazz. There's modal logic. There's yeah. like mode of a, a statistical distribution. There's a multimodal transport. There's like all these other things, which I kind of like. I, and I feel like that's like a general kind of two thousand twenties, two thousand tens trend. Like companies just pick like a weird term, a noun that like doesn't really mean anything, but kind of means a lot of things. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so you have now explained it. It is related to this idea of fabric. Um, yeah. And so there is something clever there. I thought it might be something obvious that would be embarrassing to me. That <laughs> no. it is some computer science thing. You're like, oh, you don't know modal, idiot. No, 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 <laughs> no, no. The funny thing is, like, now, like, I, I need to like make like I, I've been meaning to like um, create like custom T-shirts for my team. And every time like I want to do it, I always get hung up on like, no, it has to be modal fabric. <laughs> and like, but I can't find any manufacturers that actually do like custom T-shirts. What does it modal. mean? What it's is like, it? It's like some sort of type of fabric made of beach or something like beach trees. Oh, beach trees. I think maybe oh, something wow. like that. It's supposed to be very smooth. <laughs> cool. We'll have to get our hands on some. I don't know. Um, so before Modal, before you got into this world of fabric, um, you were a CTO of another startup for six years. And you grew the technology team there at Better yep. from one to 300 people on the technology team, which is yeah. crazy. Yeah. You interviewed over 2,000 people. Yeah. It's a lot of people. And a lot of people. So our listeners often want to know what you know, kind of uh, interview tricks there are out there, what they should be looking for. So um, what did you learn from so many interviews? And what could our audience learn from that? Like, Are there uh, low-hanging fruits that aspiring engineers, data professionals could focus on when they're heading into an interview? Yeah, I think that's maybe two separate questions. Like one is like how to evaluate candidates from like an interviewer point of view, and the other one is like how do you you know impress the the interview. I I think if there's anything I've learned from interviewing you know thousands of people is that interviewing is like just incredibly hard, and like it's like you know having hired a lot of people that I've interviewed, and then like thinking back like who do I who did I think would be good versus who was actually good. Yes, I actually realized it's a very hard prediction problem. And that, that I think is like at the core of like what interviewing is about. Like you're getting a chance to meet someone for like, you know, four hours or whatever, and you're trying to assess, you're trying to make a prediction, is this person gonna perform in my organization, right? That's what it comes down to. That turns out like is a very hard sort of, you know, low signal to noise, you know, mm -hmm. problem. Like you, you meet someone for four hours and you have to make a, you know, a very hard decision. Um, so if there's anything I learned, it's like there is no trick really. Like you just have to like collect a lot of signals and, uh, and try to, you know, 
combine them in, in, in some way. And, and it's like funny because like some people are like, well, you shouldn't do this, you should do that. Like people have very strong feelings about how interviews should be conducted. You shouldn't do, do whiteboard interviews. You shouldn't do whatever. Like you shouldn't do take home or you should do take home. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know. To me, it like boils down to like, I don't care. If someone told me that like, you know, whether someone can like, you know, spot a car trick or like if someone could like, so, like it doesn't matter. Like if someone told me there is like some <laughs> like could spot absurd, a absurd thing yeah. that has like super high correlation with their oh, right. future ability to do well in my organization. Right. I think that's a good signal. And right. like, that's what, it, what it, you know, what it comes down to. Now, like talking about signals, I think, you know, you can sort of, you know, reverse engineer a little bit and like, you know, think about like, what are the things that generates the most signal per time? Because I think that, that that's like sort of I think good sort of heuristic for like how to design interview processes. I I tend to think that for instance like whiteboard questions are bad because at the end of the day at the end of that it, you know you spend an hour like doing a whiteboard question you get sort of like one bit of information like did they like solve this thing or not maybe not you get a little bit more but but like it's it's sort of like not like time efficient like versus like how much information you get. Uh, I I tend to for instance favor uh, code reading instead. Mm. And, and the reason is that, you know, if I, you know, write down 20 code samples or 10 code samples or whatever and go through, you know, with the candidate, like, can you spot the bug? Like, what, you know, how does this work? Can you explain, you know, how, how to optimize this code or things like that? We, you can actually cover a lot of terrain very quickly. And that is like, I think, you know, at least how I think about, you know, ways you can get more signal per time out of yeah. interviews. So, uh, that, but, but then, then it obviously boils down to like, also comes down to what role you're hiring for and things yeah. like that. That is interesting. Uh, for data science interviews on my team, uh, we do use a whiteboard a lot, but it is solving a lot of different problems. Um, so we, we have the candidate uh, work through a lot of different phases of like data science model development. Yeah. So like, you know, I'll present a problem and say, what what kinds of data are out there? How would you start on this problem? Yeah. Um, and then you can keep going down the line of, okay, then, you know, would you, how would you create a model with this? What kind of model would yeah. you have? And then so I find with, with, at least for data science interviews, with a whiteboard over an hour, I can cover like kind of from conception through to getting into production, a data science model, yeah. and dig deep. Um, on parts that like I find interesting as an interviewer, yeah, 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 yeah. I might even learn some stuff. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's very smart for two reasons. One is that you're covering a lot of different things. So it's a way to sort of decorrelate your signals. Like going back to right. how to think about signals, yeah, yeah, yeah. you want to find a lot of signals that are like kind of independent. Yeah. And then you combine them, you know, then you, you reduce the variance, right? Whereas if you go all in on like one like exactly. you know, skill, then you, you, you may more, get more variance. Fizz buzz. The, the, exactly. Like <laughs> the, the other reason why I think it's good is that I tend to think what you're doing, what you're describing, it sounds like you're doing more like filtering for more like a goal oriented type person. And I think that's actually something I've realized is that you know, it depends on the role for, for sure. Like there are different, you know, types of role that re need different types of things. But like, depending on the role, you might need like either like someone who's like more tool oriented, who like, they're like very good at like their craft. They know like Kubernetes or Docker, like whatever, super well. But for a lot of roles, you actually don't want that. Like you want someone who like fundamentally comes in every day and there's like kind of does like whatever has to get done in order for the business to get its results. Right. And, and I think, you know, kind of talking more from like a business context, I think it's very important spe specifically for data scientists. Not always, because there are some data scientists who are all about just like, you know, squeezing a couple more, you know, percentage points out of accuracy, yeah. you know, like, you know, if you're running some whatever speech recognition yeah. model for Alexa, yeah. like those people might be like super valuable. Yeah. But for like 99% of data scientists, exactly. I think, you know, you want to focus on people who are like more like business focused and totally. care about the end result. And I, I call it almost like data journalism. Like they have a, it's like almost like a pursuit of the truth. Like they're like, they think of their job as like, un, you know, they want to uncover the, the, the truth, like buried <laughs> in the data, right? That's what yeah. fundamentally like gets them going, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's interesting. You've talked a number of times in this uh, interview, what you look for in interviews explanation about signal versus noise. And um, I think there's one other thing that makes interviewing so hard. So a couple of episodes ago, episode 616, I did an episode on the four requirements for expertise beyond just the 10,000 hours thing that like Malcolm Gladwell talked about, people like yep. talked about. And so one of the things that you have to have is you have to have what they call a valid environment, which is this idea of there being meaningful signal relative to noise. So um, the smaller the signal is relative to noise, the harder it is for there to be anything to learn about, uh, to become expert in. 
Yep. But then the other thing that makes hiring so hard to become expert at is the temporal lag between making the decision and finding out whether it worked out or not. So yeah. um, the kinds of things that you can uh, become expert at tend to be things that you can learn immediately. Oh, I made the wrong chess move, you can see right away. Yeah. Oh, I answered this math problem wrong, you find out right away. Yeah, yeah. Um, whereas with hiring, it, I mean, the argument that I made in that episode was actually literally with hiring. I said, you can't really become expert at hiring because the time lag is so long. It's, yeah. it's months, years before you know. Um, and so even somebody like you who has made thousands of hiring decisions, because of that time lag, it becomes hard to be like a true expert. Like you could be like Magnus Carlsen, you know, like uh, with chess, like it's yeah. tough to develop that same kind of expertise. Totally. And, and I think those are two very different types of skills, right? Like on that spectrum between like, you know, fast, like, you know, feedback loops and like very slow feedback loops. VC, like investing in a company, oh, like how exactly. do you like, exactly. you know, it takes 10 years to know. <laughs> exactly. So I think part of it is like, you just have to develop like, you know, a strong intuition for like kind of proxy metrics. Like, you know, if you're like a VC or if you hire a person, you may, you know, it might take a year in order to like fully understand their productivity or in a case of a VC, it might take 10 years to see them go in public. Yeah. But, you know, you might be able to see like early signs, you know, earlier on. And that like then can let you have like a tighter feedback loop. But I think this is like, you know, a general problem also going from like, you know, being an individual contributor to manager is like something I thought a lot about. And, and I personally struggle a lot with, you know, is, is actually like, not that the skills themselves are necessarily different. I think the biggest thing was just like shifting from like a short feedback loop to like a long feedback loop right. cycle. Like you're so programmed, like it, growing up, I grew up programming, you know, you're so like, trained to have this like sense of like immediate gratification mm -hmm. you know you come home every day and you're like i wrote like so much code like i feel good like i put, saw this code and it's amazing right and then you start managing you just come home every day and you're like you just i don't know i just don't feel like i did anything right but like you totally. know but it, like a few years in you start to realize like actually you know i hired this person or you know i managed this person in my team i had a tough conversation and then now like six months later i'm noticing she's changed her behavior like you start to recognize those things and th right. those things become rewarding, right? right. So, and, and I think, you know, doing that, you know, it's like the marshmallow test. You kind of have to like learn right. how to like, you know, fail, like to win at the marshmallow test. I, know, this is a complete aside, <laughs> but I recently, I just this week, I read that the marshmallow test, if you control for socioeconomic factors. I've heard it, it too. Apart, yeah. I feel like all these like psychological <laughs> things, like they almost like turn into like, what's the word, like allegories. Like they're right. almost like, you know, they're almost like tales more right. than they are actually true. I mean, it's the same thing with like Dunning-Kruger. Like people talk about Dunning-Kruger effect. It turns out the original study was actually had like many flaws and wasn't really true. There's all these other things too, right? But like, I don't know. Like Remind almost me like, of that one? What's Dunning-Kruger? Dunning-Kruger is this idea that like, you know, there's like an inverse correlation between knowing how much you know about something and realizing how bad, like uh, this like, people think of it as like a U curve. Like when you don't know right. anything, you think you're really good at it. Right. It's actually not what it is. It, it, there's, you know, it just, you know, but, but like roughly speaking, the way people interpret it is like, when you don't know anything, you think you're good. And then as you learn things, you realize that you don't know about it. And then you like finally become an expert. Then you realize you actually know a lot of things about it again. Right. Again, that's not what it is, but that's what people think it is. Gotcha. And I think as such, maybe like it's fine to refer to as, to, I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, I've, I've drifted you off course. That's fine. <laughs> um, I don't know if you had a thought to finish or if you want me to move on to the next no, question. No, I, I, maybe. I, yeah, I don't know. Trying to create studio quality podcast episodes remotely used to be a big challenge for us with lots of separate applications involved. So when I took over as host of Super Data Science, I immediately switched us to recording with Zencaster. Zencaster not only dramatically simplified the recording process, we now just use one simple web app, it also dramatically increased the quality of our recordings. Zencaster records lossless audio in up to 4K video and then asynchronously uploads these flawless media files to the cloud. This means that internet hiccups have zero impact on the finished product that you enjoy. To have recordings as high quality as Super Data Science yourself, go to Zencaster.com slash pricing and use the code SDS to get 30% off your first three months of Zencaster Professional. It's time for you to share your story. Um, so yes, so you've now, you've kind of given us some insight into things that you look for when you're interviewing and kind of your process around interviewing, right. this idea of having multiple tests, distilling um, multiple signals that we can aggregate together um, into some hopefully overall meaningful signal that predicts long-term success in the role. 
Um, but now let's flip it. Let's do the other side. So you rightfully pointed out that I was really asking two questions. There was part A, which is about your experience as an interviewer. But then part B is, with that experience as an interviewer, what do you recommend to interviewees, to candidates, um, that would allow them, like this idea of low-hanging fruit, things that they could be doing before an interview um, to succeed? Yeah, I, I think to me, I, I, I sort of mentioned this spectrum of like tool-oriented versus goal-oriented. And, and I think, again, it depends like what type of role you're hiring for. But I think most data teams should hire for the more goal-oriented uh, uh, you know, this or outcome oriented type candidate. And, and, and for that one, I think, you know, what, what's, what's important to show, I think, you know, or at, at least I like to see as an interviewer is, um, people a being autonomous, like having this like drive to like, you know, figure things out and like, you know, on their own, you know, that's not to say they need to know everything about everything, but like, it does help when someone comes in and they're shown that like, you know, I built this data thing and first I had to go out and scrape the data and then like I fit this model and then I built like a flask cap and he look, you know, and you know, and, and like it doesn't have to be great, but like they figured out, you know, they built something end to end. I think I like to see that. That was just one example. Like, there's many of these examples. Right. I wrote a blog post or whatever, like something that shows like that, like they, they wanted to solve something end to end as opposed to someone who comes in and like, you know, just has like a, you know, they, they're like showing that they can fit, you know, uh, this right. model and this model and this model, right. then that, that makes me sort of question like, okay, like, okay, you like to fit models, but like, do you yeah. care about like the business outcomes? So I, I think that's quite important. Um, so 100%. like the autonomy and like the sort of outcome, like to me, to me, those are things. And, and like a lot of it, you know, I, I think is best manifested from, from like showing a, a, a track record of like, I, I built these like, and to, I, I'm talking more about junior candidates now. Like, yeah, yeah, I think yeah. for senior candidates, maybe it's a little bit different. Then it's more around like, you know, how do you work, especially in data teams, I think it's very important. Like, how do you work with stakeholders? How do you, you know, organize the team? How do you structure it? Like, who reports to who? Uh, what does your platform look like? And, you know, all this, this is a very different type of role to hire for. Yeah, that makes perfect sense to me. With respect to the junior one that you were describing, that kind of end-to-end -end project, you know, uh, somebody writing a blog post about something they're interested in. I love particularly when they have a narrative behind it. You know, yeah. like, hey, I'm really into basketball. Totally. And so I found this basketball data set and I was able to do this new analysis and I was able to draw these conclusions. And that actually has now changed the way that I play basketball or view basketball. Yeah, games totally. Or and I personally don't know anything about basketball or like horseback riding or whatever. But if someone writes like an amazing blog post about how they use data to for horseback riding, like, and it makes me like interested in it, that's, you know, that's cool. Um, speaking of hiring and blog posts, um, one of my favorite blog posts of yours is about this toy model that you created <laughs> yeah. for finding the ideal hires. Yeah. Um, do you want to talk us through that uh, blog post? Yeah, I, I think the sort of intuition of that blog post is a little bit, is that everything kind of turns into a trade-off. And, and, and actually, I, for hiring, I think it's, you know, intuitively a little harder to, you know, people less under, understand it a little bit less than sort of, or at least I like struggle to like realize it less so than something else like real estate, where like, I feel like if you're looking for a home, like people sort of intuitively understand you can have to make trade-offs. Like you have a certain budget right. and that means like you can't get like, you know, uh, you know, a huge terrace and like 5,000 square foot in the best prime real estate in New York, you know, whatever. <laughs> Like you're going to have to like give up like certain of those things, right? Because you have a budget that like acts as like a constraint, right? Mm -hmm. And that constraint means, you know, some people price, you know, having an outdoor space. Some people price, you know, square footage. Some people price whatever, you know, double garage. I don't know. So, and, and I think the similar thing happens in, in, in hiring. Like people indirectly has a budget, you know, have a budget that they go out in the market. It, it doesn't necessarily have to correspond to like a certain type of, you know, a dollar amount. It also, I think, could be interpreted as like, I have like my set of like candidate levels, you know, this is like the appeal of my company. This is the like tier of engineers I'm able to hire. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for most companies, unless you're like the absolute most stellar company in the world, like you're going to have to make trade-offs. Like you're not going to find candidates who are good at like A and B at the same time. You're indirectly going to have to make a trade-off between you either get A or you get B, right. right? And so... Now, wait a second. With you as Eric Bernhardson, running this cool new startup, Modal, VC-backed, 
building engineering tools for data scientists. Do you still have to choose A or B? Do you sometimes, I bet sometimes people who are the A and B do come to you. I mean, you can I, hire I, I like to think so, but like, I, I also think, you know, that's what, what you always think is like a hiring manager, right? Like, you know, everyone else makes trade-offs, but I'm actually good at like identifying, you know. So it's, you know, so that's a sort of, it, but, but anyway, so, so going back to like why these trade-offs are important, like what, what I wrote about in this blog post is that if you prioritize A, but actually B is the thing that's good for your business, like you're actually making it far worse for yourself. And if A is something like, you know, and, and so one example that I think a lot of people do is like A is credentials, B is actual job performance ability, right? right. So if you're fixated with credentials, of course you're going to have to, you know, you're implicitly trading off on actual job performance, right? right. You know, even if there's a correlation between A and B, which there often is, yeah. because, you know, the hiring market is competitive. You are indirectly, you know, because you're over-focusing on credentials, you're going to trade off and get worse candidates or vice versa. If you're focusing on, you know, people are like extremely good at tool A, they're probably going to be on average worse in tool B. Right. So I, that, that's, you know, sort of, you know, part of it is like just saying, like, you need to be very careful about like what things you focus on the most. The other thing is like, frankly, like, I think it, you know, presents a bit of an opportunity. Like, you know, I think a lot of companies out there overhire for credentials or overhire for, you know, having certain, you know, cool companies in their past. Mm -hmm. There is an arbitrage opportunity here. Right. If you're smart, you know, if you want to play Moneyball here, like you can like go and try to find, you know, the people who maybe have, you know, not the most polished resume, but like maybe stellar candidates because they stand out in other ways. And, and mm -hmm. I think that's the sort of, that's the sort of, you know, the, the, the silver lining here is that, you know, I think it means there's a certain opportunity and it's actually like good for everyone here that like, you know, that opportunity exists. And I encourage everyone to really think about that because I think there's a lot of people who may not have like the most polished resumes, but may actually be phenomenal people that, you know, if you like look a little closer, you can find those people. Yeah, it's a great point. I mean, crystal clear the way that you conveyed it here in the audio only format, but uh, we'll make sure that we have uh, a link to this uh, blog post in the show notes and you created lots of cool visuals to make it uh, yeah, visually uh, appealing to this concept as well. Yeah, there's a bunch of math and, and this is sort of a lot of graphical intuition to what I just tried to describe in words. Nice, but yeah, you nailed it perfectly. Um, so we've talked about what you're doing at Modal. We've talked about all the hiring that you did at Better. Um, prior to Better, you were famous, you are famous, for building the music recommender system from scratch at Spotify. So I think it goes without saying that Spotify is the most used music streaming service in the world. Um, and you built the original music recommender system. It's used by hundreds of millions of people every day in the world. Yeah, probably. Um, that's wild. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. To be fair, I left seven years ago. So my, my sort of joke is like when the music system, when the recommendations are really good, then it's like, yeah, of course I built it. <laughs> when it's like not good, I'm like, oh, I don't know. I had left seven years ago. I don't know what you did. So, you know, so, so to, to be clear, like I, there's, I'm sure there's a lot of stuff that has happened in the seven years since I left. But I've heard from people still at Spotify that like foundational, it's like still sort of my ideas and to some extent even still my code running it. Um, yeah, I mean, it was a lot of fun. Like I started at Spotify, I was very lucky in a way. Like I grew up in Sweden and, yeah. you know, I knew a bunch of people from school and they, you know, went to this company this obscure music streaming startup with this crazy idea, put all mm -hmm. the music in the cloud mm -hmm. and, you know, called Spotify. And I ended up joining and, you know, and I think, you know, 10 years later or whatever it is, uh, actually, no, it's crazy, it's 12 years later. Um, yeah, you're right. I mean, it's, you know, it's a massive success. And, and having been there from scratch, I, I think was sort of one of the reasons I turned into like a degenerate startup person because like being part of that journey and like that growth was, was, was amazing. But yeah, it was a fun problem. I did a lot of other stuff at Spotify too. Like I did a lot of data engineering and data science and business intelligence and other stuff. But the music recommendation system was, was, um, was funny thing is actually a large part was it, w w of it was Skunk Works. Like I, I actually built large parts of it on weekends and evenings uh, oh, kind of on my own really? uh, for, for large parts uh, of the time. And then like eventually I was able to convince people like, Spotify needs a music recommendation system. Let's actually oh, productionize this. Oh, wow. So up until you built that, people could search for their favorite artist, they could find this album that they want to listen to, and they could listen to that, but there was no, you couldn't have a song that you liked and say, just start a radio on no, this. No, no, there was no recommendation until, 
there were some very basic recommendations, but they weren't really like smart and based on machine learning until 2011, I think. Uh, actually, uh, not quite, but, but roughly speaking, yeah. Um, are there aspects of this that you can dig into yeah, on air? Totally, absolutely. Uh, so Spotify, what, what Spotify ended up doing that I think is you know like the, the best approach when you have tremendous amounts of data, which Spotify has, is essentially you know what's called to uh, collaborative filtering. So the idea is like you have all this data about what people listen to and also what people uh, what, what playlists people create. Uh, that data obviously like says a lot about, you know, if someone listens to a lot, if you see a lot of people, this sort of intuition is, if you see a lot of people listening to tracks A and B, like if those correlate a lot, then those tracks are probably pretty similar, right? And the same thing on an artist and album level, right? Now, you know, computing all these like pairwise correlations, it turns out to be, you know, very inefficient because there's like Owen square, many, you know, and there's like 30 million tracks, right? right. So, so the question is like, okay, you, we probably need something smarter. At that time, uh, there was a competition, I think, I don't know if it's like people remember it today, but you know, it used to be a big thing back then called the Netflix Prize, right? Like Netflix had this sure. like big competition where they, yep. they open sourced a bunch of data about movie, movie ratings and then offered a million dollars to the first team that would beat the, the, the benchmark by 10%. And it was solving the same kind of problem. Is it is very it similar film recommendations? It's very similar, uh, the, with the exception that in the Netflix case, people gave one to five ratings, right? In the uh, Spotify case, like I didn't have that ratings information, right? Like right. I just knew when people listen to a track, right? And, you know, and I could aggregate it up and look at like how many times people listen to it and get sort of, you know, an idea of like how much they like it. So it's sort of the same idea. Turns out actually like review and Netflix is like, they've stated this too, you know, they mostly moved away from re reviews or ratings. Like it doesn't really matter as much as like the implicit signal of people just like what they pick. For sure. But anyway, so, so I ended up building a lot of uh, models in that vein and, and, you know, and all those models were unsupervised as opposed to Netflix case, which is supervised because you have sort of a label X and Y, but, but it's the same idea. And, and in particular, the idea that I, uh, that I pursued and that, you know, worked really well was matrix factorization. And, and so roughly speaking, you know, like kind of distilling it down to sort of intuition here, like the idea is like you put, you, you create this enormous matrix, very sparse matrix where every row is a user and every column uh, is a track or an album or an artist. Right. And so you, you end up with, you know, 10 million items, 10 million rows or, or something like that and, and 10 million um, items, right? Um, again, like this matrix is, is extremely sparse, right? It's yeah, mostly yeah. zeros. Yeah. And then, but the answer in this matrix is how many times did this user listen to this track, right? Now, you know, like there's a bunch of techniques and, you know, and, and there's like traditional ones like PCA and SVD. Uh, I ended up using a bunch of different ones. Like in particular, I used a lot of NLP inspired models, like word vec was a model we used a lot. There's also a few other ones. Like oh, yeah. PLSA is like an old school version. Uh, Netflix had a bunch of papers and, and this one that, um, I forget it's by who Korn and Volinsky was, uh, that, that like people used a lot back then. But, but they, they all boil down to the same idea, which is that when you factorize this matrix, you, you find a low dimensionality representation of every user and every item. And these representations are just small vectors. Like they're vectors of 40 uh, uh, real values. So you have this like vector space now where every user turns into a point in a 40 dimensional space and every track turns into a point in the 40 dimensional space. Right. And the, the dot product between the two, like sort of, you know, you can transform that into like, like a, a prediction of like how much does yeah. that user like that track, yeah. right? In that space now, as it turns out, tracks that are very similar tend to lie close together and same with users too. So be in that like lower dimensionality space, you know, four dimensions or whatever, hundred dimensions, uh, uh, you, you have this like nice sort of ge geographical like property. The space doesn't mean anything. There's not like the X axis, like doesn't correspond to anything or yeah. the Y axis or whatever, yeah, like yeah. it's four dimensions, right? Yeah, yeah. But proximity means something. If there's two yeah. points that are close to each other, it means like those tracks are very similar. Yeah. And you, you end up seeing if you're plotting, you know, uh, different, you know, genres, you end up seeing them clustering really well, right? Uh, so the next question is like, okay, like for every track, how do we find similar tracks? And that turns out to be kind of a messy problem because like you're in four dimensional space. So you, you really want to avoid this again, like this like Owen square thing where you have to like for every track, look at every other track and compute the distance. 
So I ended up building this vector database uh, called ANOI, which stands for uh, ANN, stands for Approximate Nearest Neighbor, that basically helps you do those queries very fast. Because it turns out you can do all these like tricks in this like you know 40 dimensional space and cut down the search space very aggressively, and um, uh, so you, you know you can then take a user, and in that space you can then you know look for like track vectors that are close to that user, you know remove any track that the user has already listened to because we have that data, and then those new those tracks then turn out to be great recommendations for that user, mm -hmm. or you can take a track and look at like similar vectors to that track. And that turns out to be, you know, good, you know, uh, similar track recommendations or good sort of input for a radio station or, or something like that. Looking to take your career to the next level, but not quite sure how? Well, check out Bunch, the AI leadership coach. Bunch is the easiest way to learn critical career skills like giving feedback, resolving conflicts and communicating with confidence. And you can do it in just two minutes a day. Bunch is not a one-size-fits-all course, but a fully personalized learning journey. You learn daily from a global community of coaches, managers, and executives from companies like Calm, HubSpot, and Twitter. Download Bunch for free in the Apple App Store. Search Bunch Leadership, that's B-U-N-C-H Leadership, or simply check out the link in the show notes. Nice. So that was fun. That's what I spent. Uh, that, four or five years of my that life. That was really cool to dig into that in detail. I didn't know uh, any of that detail. And it's cool that, um, so my company uses a similar kind of approach that, and so we ended up, we've tried lots of different kinds of ways of matching candidates to jobs. Yep. Uh, based on the natural language of candidate profiles and the natural language of job descriptions. Yep. And we have tried so many, I've been working on this problem for seven, eight years now. Yep. And we've tried so many different ways of tackling it and the way that we end up doing it is very similar to what you described. Some sort of embeddings, some sort of vector model. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Using yeah. embeddings of these documents to turn them into a vector representation. Yeah. And then they're in the same space, the same high dimensional space. So in, um, in your case, you can have users and you can have songs in the same uh, kind of map. Yeah. And in our case, we can have candidates and jobs. Yeah. And then so we can say, okay, we've got this job description. It, locates to this particular point in yeah. our, uh, we use 196 dimensional space, and then what candidates are nearby in that space, and you can use very simple mathematics, like you're saying, like a dot product. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, and it's so conceptually beautiful once you get there. I mean, I think if there's any like insight I made in my life that like I'm proud of, it's like back in 2008, like I found, I realized that vector models you know, have all these like cool properties, you know, that makes them very nice as a building block for recommendation systems. And back then, I don't think a lot of, you know, there was the Netflix price, but I think that was, it was still kind of an obscure sort of, you know, not a yeah. lot. I'm really happy today that like these embeddings are quite commonplace. Oh, they're everywhere. Like OpenAI yeah. has an embedding API. There's a number yeah. of vector databases. I'm advising this uh, vector database called Weaviate. There's a few other ones too. Uh, and, and I really think that, you know, Maybe if I had, you know, done Moodle like today, or you know, now advising Vivian, but like I think there's a huge opportunity to to still build, you know, search engines and kind of rethink them from ground up. Like, you know, we have this vector database, you know, th this con concept of a vector today. Yeah. There's so many cool opportunities of like sure. doing stuff in that space. Yeah, it's a really rich way of representing information yep. for a machine um, because it collapses. Like you were describing initially, you were starting with this huge sparse matrix with 10 million rows and 10 million columns. And so to be able to collapse that down into this, uh, and so sparse for listeners who don't know, it means lots of zeros, which makes a lot of sense in the scenario that Eric's describing where you have, if all the rows are listeners and all the columns are tracks, of course, any given listener has listened to almost none of the tracks. Right. So it's all zeros. It's almost entirely zeros. Highly, highly sparse is what that means. But then what we've been talking about lately with these vector representations, you have a really dense representation because then it means for any given track or any given Spotify user, you have this uh, vector of 40 float values. Yep. And none of those, some, some of them might be near zero, but none of them are zero. Yeah. And they describe this rich location across these uh, 40 dimensions. And so, yeah, it's yeah. a really, really yeah. powerful thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, so if you aren't already using vectors for something, you might want to learn about them and consider using them. Uh, it is how, like on my data science team, we're thinking about almost all of our problems uh, in vectors all the time. Good, yeah. Um, and so you've told us now about Annoy, this open source library that you created for um, searching efficiently 
across um, these vectors. So um, it's a high dimensional nearest neighbor search. Do you want to dig into that, the technical aspects of that a little bit more? Yeah, yeah. I, there's a couple of uh, talks I've, I've done and, you know, it's, it's, so there's probably some more like uh, presentations online if you want to go super deep. But the, the rough idea is like, okay, you have this like four dimensional space, right? Like how do you how do you search that space in a, you know, less than linear way? Like you want to like not have to go through every single point in that space and compute the distance. And so the, the way annoy works, which is to be fair, is like probably like state of the art today uses other types of methods. Uh, but the way annoy works is that it partitions the space uh, into a tree. And so you, you basically pick uh, roughly a random hyperplane, although you can sort of, you know, use the data in, in, in some way to inform it. You pick a, a random hyperplane and split the space mm -hmm. and then put half the points on one side and the other half on the other side. Mm -hmm. Now you do that recursively with each subspace. So you, you take this space, you know, uh, split it again. And then you, you take the, 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 you know, each four of those and split them again until you only have, I don't know, like 10 points left in each, you know, hyperspace, right? It's a four-dimensional space. Turns out like those points that are like in each leaf node of this tree are very close to each other. Right. On the other hand, like there's this like problem now because like sometimes you ended up by accident like kind of, you know, right. picking a hyperplane like very, so that partition two points that are very close to each other. Right. So the trick then is to, you know, do this about, you know, a few hundred times or 10, 40 times or something like that. So there's both during the search phase, uh, uh, you know, when you're searching through the space, sometimes you actually go on both sides of the plane. So, you know, if you're searching like, you know, on, on, uh, if you have a query point, you, you kind of go down the, like, the, the tree, you know, and, and pick, go on the same side all, always. And then, like, you end up in a leaf node. But sometimes you actually want to also, like, look at the other side if you're close enough. And the other trick, as I mentioned, is also you do this hyperspace partitioning scheme, you know, 10 to 20 to 100 times where you, like, you know, start over with all the million points and, you know, repartition the space. And so you end up with 100 trees. And now you can search all those trees in parallel, actually. Uh, and uh, and find near points. Uh, so that's, that's sort of rough intuition. More modern methods, I should point out, they, they use a very different approach, which is probably better. Uh, they use like a graph-based approach instead. They try to build a graph of points that are close to each other. Right. I know less about that, but uh, there's a bunch of state-of-the-art algorithms like Face that by Facebook and uh, a few other ones. Cool. Uh, that was a crystal clear explanation, uh, and there was some great hand waving <laughs> that Eric did here. If you yeah. If, you're listening to the audio version and you're like, maybe I could perceive this just a little bit better if I had hand motions. The YouTube version of the podcast will have those for you. Yeah. <laughs> um, I wish I could like overlay it, like on a, you know, split in the air. I could like, you know, color the air, like red and blue, you know. There, there's an amazing YouTube channel by someone named Alfredo Canziani. Have okay. you heard of him? No. So Alfredo um, is a lecturer on some of Jan LeCun's courses yeah. at NYU. Hmm. And what he's done is he's, um, so they, uh, during the pandemic, they, they moved to having all courses online and NYU published these classes that Jan LeCun and Alfredo are offering online. And then what Alfredo painstakingly has done is he has done exactly what you described. He's added graphics um, that enable visualizations of equations yeah. and concepts and graphs. Yeah, and so he's amazing. created a really cool uh, YouTube channel. I'll have to check it out. Um, yeah, it's great. I'll try to remember to include a link uh, to Alfredo uh, in the show notes. Um, and uh, if anybody knows him, try to get him on the show. About a year ago, him and I corresponded back and forth a bunch of times. And he was interested in the show, but he was too busy making these very elaborate YouTube videos. And I'd love to have him on. Um, so, yes. So that's annoy, And then... Another really popular open source tool that you built at Spotify is Luigi. Yeah. Which is a great name. That one's really obvious to me because it's like for pipes. <laughs> so and it's got, green, like and Spotify. <laughs> That's the other okay. connection. That's, right. Uh, that was going to be my next question is why not Mario? And now we know. Yeah, so. now you know. Uh, yeah, I mean, like at Luigi, you know, uh, I think before Airflow was big, Luigi had a lot of users. And I think it's sort of a similar thing where like I wanted a tool, I, as I was building the music recognition system at Spotify, I ended up with this very complex pipelines. And, you know, I would have to run them for like weeks sometimes and like things would crash and I needed a way to sort of 
re, you know, resume from a sort of a partial state where like certain things were created, certain things not. And, and I had to deal with all these things, you know, you write some data to disk, but is it like really like, you know, fully complete, like, you know, the, the, the sort of atomicity of like, you know, producing artifacts and that kind of stuff. So I, so I ended up building Luigi. It was sort of inspired by Makefile actually, which is like all like compiler thing mm -hmm. uh, that's like really annoying to use, but has this like elegant idea of like sort of, you know, uh, framing everything as a, a, a graph problem, a dependency graph. It, people talk about DAGs, depend, um, directed acyclic graphs, yeah. um, which, you know, in, in reality just means like dependency graphs, right? Like you have this, you know, this thing depends on this, depends on this, and then Luigi lets you model that pretty nicely. And so I think for a while, like, you know, it made a lot of sense to use Luigi for a lot of those things, and a lot of companies had similar problems as it, as it turned out. Yeah. I open sourced it just like thinking, well, maybe someone's going to use it. And then, you know, a couple of years later, a lot of companies did. Um, over time, a bunch of other stuff came out, like Airflow came out, you know, and I think Airflow, it, it has like certain things that are worse, but I also think, you know, overall, like it has like a web interface that people really like, has a bunch right. of other stuff. And I think that, you know, clearly, you know, was, you know, the thing that, that resonated with people. Today, you know, there's even more competitors. There's like, you know, Prefect, there's Flight, there's Daxter, uh, probably a bunch of other ones I forget. Uh, it's an interesting space. I, I think a lot about it. Uh, but Luigi, I, you know, I'm, I'm glad someone called it like you either uh, live to be, a, a, you know, you either die here or you live to be a villain. And, you know, I'm kind of glad maybe <laughs> his argument was that Luigi died a hero because, you know, it died out and then no, no one really uses that anymore. Although there are like maybe a couple of companies still using it, but I don't think many companies use it today. I certainly haven't maintained it for many years and it's sort of been right. left to, to, to sort of atrophy a little bit. But um, I think the ideas, at least, I think, hopefully, yeah. will have you know survived. Have really longer. taken off in these uh, commercially backed yeah. um, applications like Airflow. Um, so uh, you just mentioned that you kind of let uh, Luigi rot. <laughs> um, so yeah. you've created a lot of open source repos over the year, uh, including the very meta uh, repo, which is a GitHub repository analysis project. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I got interested in like how code grows originally i mean i started writing a blog post so actually the blog post kind of drove the, the 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 tool itself i wrote a blog post about like how programming how like programming projects sort of evolve and i had this like thesis that like you know well-structured program well-structured repos they have like lower churn of the code right like they have like a solid foundation look at the linux drive like the, the, the linux repo right like the Linux have, you know, an extre extremely solid core, like in the kernel, right? Mm -hmm. And then all these drivers is like super modular, right? Like all these network drivers and hardware drivers. And, and you know, you look at the Linux kernel, like the average half-life of code is extremely high. So I got interested in that. Like, what is the half-life of code, you know? And, and, and so I ended up calling it the Git of Theseus after um, Ship of Theseus, which right. is like this old, you know, apocryphal story of... Uh, uh, you know, a ship, you replace every part of the ship, is right. it still the same ship? Right. I don't know, like, you know, so that was a good of thesis. It often gets used with aging analogies when you talk about people aging. Yeah, yeah. So, every um, cell in your body is new. Yeah. You know, are you still the same person? You know, yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's, so it's like, so there's, <clears throat> if, I don't know, I, I'm really into this idea of, I, probably a lot of people are, I think <laughs> we're at a point in history where certainly more than any other point in history so far, there are, you know, people are living longer, people are healthier longer, and there are innovations that are coming out that we're applying to mice and rats yeah. that allow what appear to be them getting younger uh, from a, a yeah. biochemical perspective. And so, um, yeah, so it, it, it ends up bringing this ship of Theseus uh, analogy up a lot because this is idea that maybe you could live for hundreds or thousands of years, but like you're none of the same parts as you were uh, yeah. at the beginning. Yeah. So then, yeah, it, it raises interesting questions about like identity and stuff. Yeah, who are you? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's very deep. <laughs> I'm convinced that we're the last generation to die, which is like kind of terrifying. I think like people are going to figure that out. Like my kids may not die. I don't know. Yeah, Maybe it's possible. Kids. Or it could end up being something like, I think uh, I might get this analogy quite wrong. There's probably some aging expert out there that's going to say that I'm getting something about this wrong. But I think that um, some... Uh, organisms like tortoises, they don't age in the sense that um, they're no more likely to die in year yeah, 200 yeah. as year two yeah. um, 
they, it's just that at some point something happens, like you get a virus or a shark eats you or yeah, whatever. Yeah, totally. Yeah, there's like a sort of hazard rate. They have a constant hazard rate. Like yeah. if you look at humans, their lifespan has this like gumball, whatever, I don't know how to pronounce it, gumball distribution, right? Which like the hazard rate grows over time. Like your, your likelihood of dying goes up, you know, every year. Whereas if you look at like tortoise, like you said, they have, a, I believe, an exponential distribution, which has a constant hazard rate. Mm. The only reason why I know a lot about this is I actually <laughs> spent a lot of time on uh, doing, uh, working on survival analysis for a very different, I looked at like conversion of, you know, uh, customers to, to, you know, paying customers, like that right. kind of stuff. But How I, can I we got, make our best paying customers live forever? We're going to take, where are our... Not our, quite that. <laughs> no, I, I'm just more interested in like what probability distribution tends to model, know. you know, a person coming in, like how long they're going to take to convert. Yeah. But it turns out like all the literature about that sort of, you know, analysis, you know, it's called survival analysis. It comes yeah. from like understanding mortality, right. you know, in particular like in actuarian science, like life insurance, right? right? So instead of looking at people converting from, you know, buying a product, it's about people dying. And so, you know, it, it's, it's, it gets, yeah, it's a little interesting, morbid. Right, yeah. Uh, put but actuaries we, out of business. We, we veered off, we, we were talking we, about We have veered git. off. We were <laughs> it's all related, man. Yeah, uh, ship of Theseus is where ship we of left Theseus. off. Yeah, um, yeah. You yeah. you were making some software related point. Yeah, yeah. I yeah, and and so anyways, I ended up building a, an open source repo that analyzed this, uh, and uh, yeah, I still actually use it on my own code to look at you know growth over time. It's very interesting. Cool. Um, so yeah, we got that repo. You had repos for uh, AI algorithms, models that generate fonts that play chess. Uh, and several others. We're going to leave a bunch of them uh, for you in the show notes, such as uh, uh, the deep fonts. <laughs> that's, yeah, and that's old, to be fair. Like, I, you know, that was the time in my life when I had more time to play around right. with, with. And that's where I'm getting to with this question is, Eric, we've noticed that you haven't had as much time lately. You know, you're creating a startup. Uh, there doesn't seem to be as much time. We're not seeing as much activity. Uh, on GitHub as we used to from you. Yeah. Um, so wh what would you be doing today if you had the time? Um, you know, you exit modal tomorrow and on Monday you can start uh, on some new open source project. What do you think you would do? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, modal is kind of, <laughs> in a way, like the thing I always wanted to build. So I I'd certainly love it. <laughs> you start, you just, you exit and then you just, you just, yeah, you just stay working there, creating open source yeah. versions no, of I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I like one area that I've been like sort of interested in, you know, that I never have time to, to investigate is like, I, I'm very interested in like probabilistic programming and like quantifying uncertainty. Like mm -hmm. I find that like, those methods have a lot of promise, but are very inaccessible in my opinion, right? Like I've been in so many business meetings where like someone just like throws up a chart and you know, and then you realize when you ask questions, like this is based on like way too few users. Like you can't really know, like you can't really like make, you know, reliable conclusions from this because it's very noisy. And, and but, but like quantifying uncertainty is actually a very hard problem. Right. And so I, I think that's, uh, that's an area that I've tried to learn, you know, sort of, you know, slowly over time, learning a lot about Bayesian statistics. That's what I was just going to say, are you a Bayesian guy? But yeah, yeah, and you know, Bayesian statistics, you know, MCMC methods, uh, yeah. you know, it turns out, it, I mean, it's hard, right? Like, you know, these things, but, but I, I wonder if there's a way to make it more accessible. Actually, like speaking of charts, like I also think visualization is such a, you know, ma massive opportunity. Like I, I love spending time on like making charts beautiful and like which is like really kind of vanity side of me but uh you know but it's hard like i i, I wish there's like better tools for that like that's actually an area i would love to spend time on yeah i used to uh prior to being big in python i was big into r and yeah. i found plotting in there like the ggplot yeah. to be really fun to work with and yeah people have created that like there had been i don't think they're maintained anymore but there used to be GitHub repos that were supposed to be like that same kind of grammar, yeah. graphics, ggplot style um, in Python. And it never had all the same functionalities are. And to my knowledge today, those libraries aren't maintained very well. Yeah, and, and, and it's actually something I always wanted to spend time on. If I had more time, I would definitely like sit down and learn ggplot because I keep hearing the same thing. Like plotting in ggplot is much better than you know it's ever been in Python. I, I kind of love and hate matplotlib. 
you know, it makes me, you know, in the end, usually make, you know, beautiful charts, but it's like very confusing and unintuitive in my opinion. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would love to learn ggplot. Um, let's put a pin in these tools that you love for one second so that I can mention if, if listeners are interested in episodes on probabilistic programming, uh, in episode 585, we had Thomas Wiki who leads the PyMC project. Yep. Um, and that's a fascinating episode on probabilistic programming if, if the listeners want to hear more about that. But then back to the thing that you were just talking about, Eric, um, which was uh, tools um, that you know, you'd love to learn more about. Are there tools that you are excited about today that you are using or have just gotten into that you'd love to share with the audience that you think listeners should know about? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, like in, in general, like a thesis I have, and, and Modal is certainly like sort of part of that thesis. And, and by the way, Modal is obviously a tool, you know, like <laughs> so should, people should learn about. Uh, but, but, but besides Modal, let's put it aside, you know, for a second. I'm not going to, you know, uh, promote it in too much. But uh, I, I think there's sort of a broader trend of, you know, things moving towards serverless and, you know, people not having to think as much about infrastructure. And, uh, and, and I actually think that like most of that, the, you know, the, the sort of cool project so far has been more sort of front end related or database related. So that's like certainly like, that's like an area where I think there's a lot of cool stuff. I, I would just say in general, like on the front end side, like I dabble with front end, but I'm a terrible front end engineer, but you know, it feels like just so much like crazy innovation going on there, uh, that, you know, if I had time, like I would. Uh, spend more time on on things like you know really learning you know new cool things like Svelte or Next.js or whatever it is like all these like crazy stuff they're doing around building custom compilers or doing WASM stuff like I think there's some really cool stuff there. Uh, but going back to the serverless stuff and infrastructure stuff, like I think a tool like I've been using a lot recently is Pulumi that I think is kind of cool. Um, you know, it's essentially just like Terraform but like programmable. I think, in my opinion, like, you know, the Terraform, like, the, the only, like, flaw with Pulumi is this, it doesn't go far enough. Like, I would love to just, like, put application code in together with infrastructure and just, like, make it all code and just have the code describe its own infrastructure. Mm -hmm. but, but what I like about Pulumi is, like, to me, you know, it was the first sort of framework where I felt like playing around with it. Like, it sort of, you know, made me feel like I'm programming the cloud, like I'm programming infrastructure, which I think is, like, a really cool feeling. Uh, but yeah, other than that, like I'm, I think there's a lot of databases that are really exciting. DuckDB, SQLite, I think Neon is a new database that's serverless that Nikita from, from Single Store is working on. That wow. I think, you know, there's, there's a lot of like that kind of stuff, a lot of, a lot of innovation in that space that, you know, I wish I had more time to play around with. That was an amazing list of different, uh, categories of tools. And then lots of specific examples in those tools. That was a really impressive run through. Okay. Uh, so we, uh, something that we started doing, I don't know, six months ago, roughly in the podcast, is we find five segments of the whole episode that we think are like really great um, answers to a specific question, and uh, and then we put those as you know, so it could be a, a two minute episode or a ten minute, uh, not episode, a two minute video or a ten minute video on YouTube on this kind of discrete topic. And I know for sure. <laughs> That what you just did, running through all of those super uh, valuable tools across so many different spaces, this is going to be a, a standalone YouTube. Clip okay, sure. sounds good. Uh, that was awesome. Uh, so we have some audience questions. So um, when we have really well-known guests come on the show like you, I try to, about a week before we record the episode, post on social media, on LinkedIn, and on Twitter um, that, hey, Eric Bernhardsen is going to be on the show. Do you have any questions for him? And your uh, the social media post about you had a huge amount of engagement uh, at time of recording, over 13,000 impressions on the post that you will be uh, here on the show on LinkedIn. And we had a great question here from Matthias Baudino. So he's a BI analyst at Brain Technology. Um, he says, what an amazing guest. Um, as a question, I would ask Eric, uh, what are the benefits of developing Luigi over adopting an existing tool and work from there? So he says, I know that if you make the framework yourself, you will have much more control over its features and can develop it to serve your needs to the most complex details, but I would love to hear the response. So this does kind of tie into something that we've already talked about earlier in the episode, but from a specific angle, which is just this idea of when you're, I don't think he means to be talking about Luigi specifically. He's yeah. kind of talking about when you're thinking about creating an open source project, 
How do you decide like, no, there's definitely, you, you kind of, you mentioned doing it out of spite before. Yeah. yeah. So how do you know spitefully that certainly the tool that you need doesn't already exist and you're going to have to make it? I, I, I used to think, or at least I still think that, you know, my sort of rule of thumb here is that what should you open source or not? And I almost think you should open source by default. Like I think for almost like, you know, for most stuff you end up building at a company, you should think of like open source, not as like, you know, you opt into it, but you opt out to it. And like, when you opt out, you opt out if, you know, it's either like core competence of the business or if it's not standalone or, you know, if it's like plausibly like not useful for like any other, you know, but, but if those three things are true, like, you know, is this something that's like relatively standalone, you know, it's like self-contained, like it, you know, sits in a box over here and like does a thing and, you know, it's potentially useful for other people and, you know, it has this attribute where, you know, it's, or it, it, there's like no like sort of core competence of like, you're not like sort of, you know, putting out like, you know, business secrets here. Then I, I think, you know, it might be a good thing to do to open source something. Awesome. That is a crystal clear answer. Um, so Eric, this episode has been phenomenal. I expected nothing less. Um, before I let you go, a question that I ask all of our guests on the program is if you have a book recommendation for us. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I used to read a lot of books. The last couple of years has been a little less with kids and, and startups and stuff. What, one like kind of like random area like I fell into and then I just like kept going was like, I got really interested in like companies that like failed. Mm. And I feel like there's almost like a whole genre of like business books about it. Mm -hmm. There's a very good one called Hard Landing about the airline industry. Uh, there's very good about like, you know, the struggles of, you know, uh, uh, you know, making money in the airline industry. There's of course, of course, a number of like, you know, company scandals about, you know, there's, there's a good book about Enron. Uh, I forgot the name. Uh, is that the smartest guys in the room or something like that? Right. Uh, if, that if is what it's called, called, I think. Yeah. Yeah. There's bad blood about Theranos. Yep. Uh, there's a, a, a great book about, uh, research in motion called losing the signal. That is very good. Mm. Uh, there's a pretty good book about GE called, um, lights out or something like that yeah, general electric. that's right electric yeah uh and there was another good book that i was just thinking about uh, uh long-term capital management when genius fails it's a very yes. interesting book yes uh so i i don't know i got sort of fascinated in this because like they're all like examples of like companies maybe with the exception exception of bad blood which was outright fraud and enron too but like companies who like kind of did a lot of things well yeah but still like you know led to like you know massive sort of, you know, massive destruction of shareholder value. And I find it really fascinating. It's like, what, what ended up happening? Like what went wrong? Yeah. So, so that's been sort of like an interesting genre I've been reading a lot about. That seems, it seems like the kind of thing that there might be some, uh, there might be some satisfaction in reading some of those books, especially, you know, like the Theranos situation, people committing that kind of fraud, then you get to kind of probably enjoy some schadenfreude as they start to get caught. Yeah, um, for well, sure. While at the same time, you get to learn business lessons for yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And maybe that's a cynical thing. It's like, I just like to have, you know, it's like the <laughs> shot of it. But, but I think, you know, even in Bad Blood, like there's something like I'm trying to understand here. It's like, why did, you know, investors believe in this? Like, it's wild. You know, and, oh, and I think so there's wild. this like suspense of disbelief going too far. And I think yeah. there's these like organizations of, com you know, complacency and yes men and like, you know, it, it, and then like, it, it goes much further. You're like, I almost like, you know, I got a really interested in like dictatorships and like how they sustain and right. like, you know, yeah. what keeps them going. Yeah. Like, I, I think there's like so many like interesting patterns throughout history of like, and you know, corporate history of like, you know, companies that like, you know, create a dilution and then like, you know, eat that dilution dilution and like, just like, you know, keep, keep, you know, living off that dilution. And then real, you know, one day it just all comes down. I think that's fascinating. I don't know. Yeah. I agree. I don't know. I find that fascinating right now. There are a few regimes in our world today that have taken some big moves and it seems to have uh, made the rickety foundations rickettier. And uh, yeah, who knows? Maybe at the time, this, I'm not going to talk about specifically what the things are because by the time that this episode airs, it might be a very different situation. But there are some yeah. really, really interesting things. And I'm happening. also not going to get into specifics, but I think <laughs> if you surround yourself with people who say yes to all your crazy ideas, mm -hmm. And, you know, who like praise you for, you know, coming up with those ideas, mm -hmm. you're going to make like more and more stupid ideas. Mm -hmm. Exactly. 
Yep. And yeah, we've seen some of that in recent years. Um, Eric, this has been an awesome episode. I've loved digging deep into technical topics, um, startup entrepreneurship topics, as well as uh, our, our random asides into things like the ship of Theseus and uh, how we're going to live forever for sure. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, and um, so starting to wrap up the episode, I no doubt there are many listeners out there who would love to hear more from you after the podcast. How should they follow you? You can follow me on Twitter. Uh, my handle is Bernhardson, like my last name. It's kind of hard to spell, but I'm sure you can share it in the footnotes. Yep, for sure. Um, and you know, you should obviously you know check out model.com. You should check out my blog, ericburn.com, which you know needs a little bit more blog posting, uh, which I'm working on right now. Finally, after yeah, can you give us a sneak peek as to what you're working on? I'm, I'm you know I'm writing on a. I actually have like multiple blog posts. Like I just need to sit down and finish it. It's kind of ridiculous, but like one I'm working on is like where I think the cloud is going. It's actually kind of mostly an extension of like a lot of tweeting I've been doing recently. But like my sort of grand thesis is like we're still like fairly early in cloud adoption, and we still haven't like really re like thought through how we operate with the cloud as developers. And I think there's some massive you know value creation that you know can happen if we start to realign our workflow with how the cloud works and and it enables us. So that's like one thesis I have. Then a bunch of other stuff I also nice. I'm working on. Exciting, yeah, we look forward to that. Uh, yeah, you are an epic tweeter, an epic blogger. It's been an honor to have you on the show, Eric. And yeah, maybe in Thank a couple you. of years. It's been a lot of fun. We can catch up again. Yeah, we'd love how to. You doing? Yeah. Thank you. Nice. Thanks, Eric. Thank you. Well, the legendary Eric Bernhardson certainly did not disappoint. I've been following his work closely for years, so it was such an honor to meet him and chat data science with him today. I hope you gained as much from our conversation as I did. In the episode, Eric filled us in on how he started his company Modal because he needed the tools they're building and how he aims to eventually replace the Kubernetes standard for model deployment. He talked about how he recommends focusing on hiring goal-oriented people as opposed to tool-oriented ones how the best way to impress him in an interview is to explain an end-to-end -end data science project you undertook to solve a problem that personally interests you. He talked about how the Spotify music recommendation model relies upon collaborative filtering of implicit song preferences and collapsing sparse matrices into dense vector representations in order to be able to provide recommendations instantaneously. He talked about how his annoy library enables efficient searching through high dimensional vector spaces by partitioning the space with random hyperplanes and how he particularly recommends the tool Pulumi, an open source infrastructure as code tool. As always, you can get all the show notes, including the transcript for this episode, the video recording, any materials mentioned on the show, the URLs for Eric's social media profiles, as well as my own social media profiles at superdatascience.com 619. That's superdatascience.com 619. If you'd like to ask questions of future guests of the show, like an audience member Matthias did during today's episode, then consider following me on LinkedIn or Twitter as that's where I post who upcoming guests are and ask you to provide your inquiries for them. If you'd like to engage with me in person, as opposed to just through social media, I'd love to meet you at the Open Data Science Conference West, ODSC West, which will be held in San Francisco from November 1st through 3rd. I'll be doing an official book signing for my book, Deep Learning Illustrated, and we'll be filming a Super Data Science episode live on the big stage with the world-leading deep learning and cryptography researcher, Professor Don Song, as my guest. In addition to the formal events, I'll also just be hanging around, grabbing beers and chatting with folks. It'd be so fun to see you there. All right, thanks to my colleagues at Nebula for supporting me while I create content like this Super Data Science episode for you. And thanks, of course, to Ivana, Mario, Natalie, Serge, Sylvia, Zara, and Kirill on the Super Data Science team for producing another killer episode for us today. For enabling this super team to create this free podcast for you, we are deeply grateful to our sponsors. Please consider supporting the show by checking out our sponsors' links, which you can find in the show notes. And if you yourself are interested in sponsoring an episode, you can find our contact details in the show notes as well, or you can make your way to johncrone.com slash podcast. Last but not least, thanks to you for listening all the way to the end of the show. Until next time, my friend, keep on rocking it out there, and I'm looking forward to enjoying another round of the Super Data Science Podcast with you very soon.